Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be joined by writer, occultist, and collapsitarian John Michael Greer on this week's podcast. My introduction to him was his article where he talked about The Great Reset, entitled The Great Leap Backward, where he offered some pretty beautiful and unrecognized optimism, where most seemed to be confused and fearful. I was then brought to his 2005 essay where he discussed his theory of civilizational collapse, entitled How Civilizations Fall, A Theory of Catabolic Collapse. Now along with his very friendly and thought-provoking forum where he discusses, among many other topics, occultism, while you can find, uh, which you can find at Ecosophia, Ecosophia, E-C-O-S-O-P-H-I-A dot dreamwidth dot org, and along with his expansive bibliography, I thought it would be nice to pick his brain on the subjects of spirituality and civilizational collapse. Thank you for coming on, John. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. So... As someone who is relatively new to your work, and as a Christian, I really uh-huh. thought it would be interesting to get your perspective on, on things that I've only seen, really, from a, a, a Christian's perspective. Uh-huh. And, and uh-huh. nowadays, there seems to be uh, some level of, like, I don't know, a spiritual revival that I, I feel like uh-huh. when my childhood, I only saw a lot of mainline Protestantism. So, uh, I, I guess at first, what brought you to druidry and i mean did you grow up in christianity at all and no not at all i was i was raised in um western washington which at that time was the most unchurched part of the country um i've never Mm. even been been baptized i um was i was exposed to christianity a little bit by way of um, kids that i knew growing up and you know took took a kind of casual interest in it as kids will at that time um most of the people that I knew were not so much um, atheist or agnostic as apathetic. They simply didn't care about issues of spirituality. Yes. Um, I'm sure you've seen that a lot. Yes. Um, so basically, as, as, I got into, as I got into adolescence, I became interested in, in issues of you know, philosophy and, and the, the purpose of life, all the big questions that, that teenagers will start thinking about. And um, I looked at Christianity. I looked at Buddhism. There's plenty of that in Washington State, since it's um, it's got a very large Asian population, of course. Yes. Um, I looked at several other religions. Um, I found my way to Druid recently because um, I, for me personally, and this is not something that I, I'm not saying setting this out as a rule for anyone else. Please note, for me personally, I've always been closest to the divine outdoors, not in a yes. building. Yes, and not and not with not so much with people as just being out there in the woods or out there on the wow. you know, in any kind of situation. And Druidry speaks to that because it's very much an a, a, a faith of of sen- sensing and perceiving the divine within nature. It's also very open ended in terms of how one conceptualizes the divine. It's, you know, some religions like Christianity have these very specific creeds, which is fine. Um, if you find yourself in agreement with those, if you don't, you're kind of out of luck. Where yes. Druidry is more an open-ended thing that says, okay, um, human beings are ultimately not that bright. <laughs> we don't actually know that much about the spiritual powers that shape the cosmos. Mm. Uh, we do know that um, there are certain practices, certain approaches, certain attitudes that um, conduce to that. So um, have at it. So that's basically how I wandered my way into Druidry. Do you, um, so I really like that you said that, and uh, specifically about how when you're outside, Mm -hmm. you get that feeling. And that reminds me of Henry David Thoreau. It reminds Mm -hmm. me of uh, transcendentalism. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I, uh, there's something about that. I I don't know, I I Mm -hmm. feel, there's like things that I feel are happening Mm -hmm. without even people recognizing them. Mm -hmm. And what, so I, so all, I guess I grew up in, (laughs) it's funny you mentioned it too. I grew up in a literally, atheist household my dad was atheist my mom you know that apathetic and so Mm -hmm. i grew up without any sense of meaning Mm -hmm. and so i feel like um there there's this interesting like i I know people exactly my age who who have are were in the same exact situation but Mm -hmm. um uh i i don't know how to really frame it um but what is what is? Do you believe in moral absolutism? Like, uh, is there, a, I guess, what you could call like a right and wrong energy, or, or? Well, no, no. This, this is one of those places where hu- human concepts don't necessarily work that well, because it's very easy to be caught up in concepts of good and evil, and then you try putting those into practice, 
And um, very often, the louder somebody talks about good, the nastier their behavior is to other people. Yeah. So um, I believe there are moral absolutes, but I don't think human beings are capable of understanding them. Just as I believe there, there are truths. There are wow. absolute truths out there. But, he, but again, we're not that bright. Wow. So I mean, the human... The human brain is like six inches long. So you, have six, you have six inches of soggy gray jello, and you're right. using that to try to comprehend a universe that is trillions of light years across. One of these things is not like the other. And so um, the, the tradition that I've found when it comes, when it, when it comes to, um, to ethics, to ethics and morals, the tradition that I've always found most meaningful is the one called virtue ethics. I don't know if you've encountered it, but it's it's actually based on uh, originally on, on ancient Greek writings and of the work of Aristotle and so on. And it basically um, it be, um, um, Alistair McIntyre, I believe, was the the modern writer who really who really got that out in his book After Virtue. And he he argues that basically what we know is that there are certain attitudes toward the world, certain ways of acting that we call virtues. And if you pursue these virtues, you know, the results are generally more successful for everyone. We have things like courage. We have things like temperance. We have things like prudence. We have things like self-control. We have things like mercy. Where do these you, are virtues. And so, you, sorry, go ahead. I was just where, so for, in my own point of view, I believe mm -hmm. that man has some level of ordainment, right? Mm -hmm. We have almost a uh, we have an obligation uh, to some a absolute good. Do, so mm -hmm. do you do you think man was ever or ordained in some way? I mean, is, is there some kind? Well, let, actually, let me. Is there a connection between man and the spiritual world that's special? Um. Okay. Now that's one of the places where Christianity and Druidry differ. Right. Um. In the to the Druid te within the Druid teachings, everything is alive. Everything is conscious. Everything has a connection, has its own distinct connection, its own unique connection to the spiritual world. There is no, I mean, nothing can exist without a connection with the spiritual world. There is no such thing as dead matter. There, the, the, yeah. When the scientists are babbling on about how the universe is just a lump of dead matter in space, they've got their hands <laughs> up their butts. Okay. It's an there ugly way to just see the world in a romantic yeah, sense, too. Yeah, what, a hor what a horrible way to look at the world. Right. And a way that's not, I mean, a way that will give you a lot of options for taking control of things and bossing them around and, you know, um, making a complete wreck of things as we're now doing. But, but it, does it work in the long run? No, it does not. But to, to go on to your question of ordainment, because that, that, that's actually something I can address directly. The Druid idea is that. Yes, but it's different for every individual soul. It's not wow. that man as a kind of collectivity, you know, I, I've never met this, this person, a man. There are lots of people. There are lots mm. of individuals. Okay. And, each, and each, of us has, each of us is called to some relation to the spiritual realm, some relation to the divine. But what that is does seem to vary from person to person. It's one of the reasons that paying attention to the virtues is very important because some people are called to focus on, other, on one virtue and some people are called to focus on others. There are people who are ob obviously their, their focus in life is you know, the, the, the hard virtues, things like courage. Okay, that's obviously what the, that's what they're called to do. There are others for whom the soft virtues, like mercy, are more important, and that's as it should be. We live in a in a very complex world with a lot of different people and a lot of different things to do, and we need people who practice all those virtues. And I don't think any one human being can practice literally all of the. I mean, sometimes <laughs> they get in they get in the way of each other. How can you know if you're focused on mercy? How can you fight? And sometimes you have to fight. Interesting. Interesting. So. Yeah. Um, so again, my view, not a universal. Um, oh no! Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. One one of the basic druid principles: there ain't no such thing as one true way for everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, well, do you believe in 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 gods or in a god or oh, or yeah. it's some kind yeah. of creator? Um, okay. N now, creator is, is, a is a different thing. Do I believe in right. gods? Yes. People okay. encounter them all the time. I know people who, I know devout Christians who um, talk about their experiences of Jesus, and I have no reason to think they're lying. 
Right. I know, you know, there are, there are many people who have encountered many gods. Clear, I, I'm a polytheist, in case you can't tell. I tend to think <laughs> that there are lots of gods. People interact with them. It seems to be, a, to be a good thing. I understand this isn't the way monotheists look at things, but that's fine. You know, the, the, again, it's a big world. Um, now, yeah. did they create the world? I don't know. I wasn't there at the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, did some of them take them? Were some of them involved in creating the world and others of them not? Very possibly. And that's certainly what a lot of traditional uh, traditional legends and stories say. But ultimately, that's not the important thing to me. The important thing is that they're here now. We can interact with them. We can we can become better people by focusing on the virtues and the insights that they teach us. And, you know, through prayer, through meditation, through other spiritual practices, we can develop as human beings and become something more than just lumps of meat lurching through pre pre-programmed routines the way scientists think we ought to be. Interesting. So it's like, uh, it's, you, so you, do you feel that, um, do you feel that there's some worship of, so I, I what I kind of noticed about people, especially mm -hmm. in this increasingly secularized world is that, mm -hmm. People, people are creatures of worship, but mm -hmm. they, and so when they believe oh, yeah. that they aren't worshiping anything, they end up worshiping their desires. Do you think that, oh, that worship, science has kind of become that? worshiping something. Yeah. There are people, human beings always worship something. Yes. Like one of the things that, yeah, one of the things that a lot of people worship these days is progress. Progress is yes. their God. They, they, they bow down at the altar. They will sacrifice anything to the, to the great God progress because they believe progress is going to lead them to the Star Trek future in the sky, okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, it's, seriously, it's a religion. Get, get somebody is. like this talking about progress, and it's just like listening to a devout Christian talking about heaven. Yeah. And, you know, it's very they're, clearly they're worshiping. And if you, if you really want to see this in action, um, point out that um, progress has been actually measurably slowing down since about 1890. Exactly, and they, yes. They lose it. They lose it completely because you've just told them their God isn't in heaven anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, well, was Nietzsche right in that sense that, that, that we have now, like, entered a new era almost of of like where man has to kind of do things for himself or uh, uh, individual people nietzsche i mean I, I love reading nietzsche he he asks brilliant questions but it's worth remembering that he ended his life stark staring yes nuts, yeah institutionalized okay uh -huh. um was he right that we're entering a new era? Yes, but new eras like that happen regularly in history. Was he right that, you know, humanity, now that God is out of the way, God is dead, and now we all have to... No. <laughs> yes, okay. Now, he was, you know, well, the, the, prob the problem with Nietzsche, and this is, this is something you really have to poke into his biography to, to understand. Nietzsche grew up he, as, as a very devout Lutheran. He was the son and grandson of of, minister, of Lutheran ministers, you know, mm. very much that, you know, he was devout, he was uh, very deep in his faith, he was also gay. Mm. And he got to, uh, it's hilarious watching his biographers avoid this, they're saying, well, wow. there's, some evidence that he, there's some evidence that he got syphilis, okay? And they're saying, well, there's <laughs> absolutely no evidence that he had anything to do with women. I'm going, well, oh, you know, no, heavens no. possibility here. Yeah. <laughs> So no, and this and this is the thing, because he grew up in this very heavy moralistic version of Christianity, okay. where, um, you know, where where every straying from the the, the 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 right path as defined by that faith is evil, and so here he is. He goes away to college. He meets a young man. He falls in love. Now you've you've. You have encountered young people in love. You know what this, mm -hmm. this amazing experience, and all of his religious background is telling him, "No, this is not love. Right. There's nothing positive like that. This is the cravings of the sinful flesh." And so, right. he because he didn't have he didn't have the benefit of growing up in a religious tradition that could handle that, or growing up in a religion tr religious tradition that at least focused on the love and mercy of God, right. rather than on, you know, God hates you and um, wants to torture you for all eternity in hell if you, if right. you it was really slip. Yeah. yeah. So, so basically, he spent the rest of his life at war with God. Okay. Yeah, well... And that's, 
And that's what, you know, you can see that unfolding all the way from his first significant philosophical work until he cracked up and, you know, and and went went crazy. And so, yeah. Um, in the meantime, he wrote some of those brilliant stuff in, in the history of philosophy, but you have to approach it knowing that there's this underlying fight with God that he's engaged in. I feel like what it, when, it, when it comes to, uh, with, uh, I guess, I don't know, religion, spirituality, God, everyone mm-hmm. kind of thinks in this term of, of legalism where mm-hmm. it's like you're not allowed to interpret I, it, there's no feeling. There's no like, like, like um, again, like going going out for a camp and or or a hike and actually just letting kind of God. Re- what what the way I interpret it mm-hmm. is is God is always trying to give you signs and and, mm-hmm. and 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 He will only do it in a constructive way. Even if I mean may, maybe it is He has to stop you in your path and yeah. destroy your life. <laughs> that's how He mm-hmm. He fixes you, or at least that's you know because if, if that's what it takes to get through to you, yes, that's what it, that's what right. it takes. Right. But, okay. But yeah. But there's all. But but it's when it sinks into that legalism. Right. And and I should say one of the things that one of the things that comes out of my polythe- polytheistic viewpoint um, is that I'm I, I believe that um, Christians are worshiping a real God, and if you're going to worship that God, you need to follow His commandments. Yeah. I have no objection to people who you know if you're going to be a Christian, you need to do these things. Um, it's just there are other options. Yeah, I know well, that's, that's one you, of the things that Christians disagree with. Well, when it like for, um, I've got friends of all like points mm-hmm. of view on this. The guy who introduced me to you, he's not a Christian. He's definitely mm-hmm. he is a very spiritual person for sure. Mm-hmm. And we have some great conversations like this. Mm-hmm. But good, good. I, I I'm um, to do that. you know, when it when it comes to things like 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 the occult, like mm-hmm. paganism, mm-hmm. from from just my own point of view, from from like a, a layman perspective. I mm-hmm. guess I guess you could call it neo paganism, like the like modern paganism. Mm-hmm. Um, it it you just kind of see it like you just see these these witcha girls. You just I, that's what I think. Of. What so what is um? I don't okay. know what. Yeah, that's no. Okay, um, let's let's start let's start with occultism. Okay, because that's something that tends to get very, very misunderstood. Right, because you're a, when you're, you're in, conservative, and these are very it's interpreted as yeah. this like hedonistic thing, you know. No. Well, that thing is, that's not what it's about. Right. What happened, okay. it's, it's just, just like, you know, well, in the history of Christianity, at regular intervals, you get these people who decide, oh, no, no, it's not about the traditions of the, you know, the traditions of the faith. We're going to just make it up as we go along. We're going to have more fun. And pretty soon you have, like, Unitarians or what have you. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Okay. The thing is, that's what neo-paganism came, that's how neo-paganism happened. Okay. Um, you had some people who were involved in in kind of the fringes of the occult movement. Gerald Gardner was one of those. He was a student of Aleister Crowley's, of whom mm-hmm. you've doubtless heard too much. Um, a very minor figure, except very colorful. And um, and so he, he he came up with this thing that was as much a sex club as anything else. Yep. I mean, yeah, it had its rituals and worship, but mostly it was, I mean, he liked to be whipped. Yeah. He had that so was one of his things, and so he put this this ceremonial flogging and ceremonial sex, and it was all. <laughs> no, seriously, it was it was basic. It was basically. A, 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 it's you almost know, a justifying your own, uh, you exactly. know, messed up hedonism uh, in a way. Yeah, exactly. But the thing is, that's that that's always very popular. That's always extremely popular, and yeah. in the wake of the Second World War, with birth control pills available the first time, people mm-hmm. felt very free to to indulge in their sexuality, and and so Wicca came to this country, or Wicca, or whatever they're calling it this week. Right, yeah, whatever um, they want to call it. Yeah, and and all of us, and then you have um, people like Starhawk and um, Margot Adler writing writing these big books, talking about how you know this is actually this is feminism, this is the empowerment <laughs> right. of women, and they're completely redefining this thing that Gerald Gardner created as a sex club, and and away they go. And so you have this, you have this thing right now. I mean, it's kind of on in its twilight phases now because, of, I mean, a lot of the big festivals have shut down now. Um, hmm. Twenty years ago, there were Wicca stores in in everywhere. Now, yeah. you have a hard time finding them. It's 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 run its course. But you had this thing where people were having, you know, lots of sex and dressing up in medieval costumes, pretending to be characters out of The Lord of the Rings or something. Yes. And thinking of what what J.R.R. Tolkien would think of that is kind of amusing, but we can get to that. <laughs> but, you know, and just going around in the capes with the swords and LARPing, basically. Literally and LARPing. 
and saying mm-hmm. it's a religion. And now, were, there were some serious people. There were some people who took it in seriously as a religion, but there weren't that many. Mm-hmm. And certainly, the people that I've the, of the people I've met, the great majority of them, they're in it for the parties. And I have no problem if people want to go out and party. I'm not going to try to stop them. It's not my my cup of tea. But hey, yeah. you know, it takes all sorts to make a world. But I do wish they would they they would not go around pretending that it's a religion. Yeah, especially you know when I mean the, the running joke among the serious occultists that, that I knew years ago was that the reason Wiccans do their rituals in the nude. Is that if anything actually happens, there will be less laundry to wash. <laughs> now, that, now, it's rude. Um, and again, there are people of whom it is not true. I, I've got to say this. There are, I've, I've met serious neo-pagans. But I have also met an awful lot of people in the party crowd. And yeah. an awful, awful lot of people who just posture around. And, um, you know, I am, you know, l- l- Lady Pixie Moon. Yes. And yes. you kiss my feet. Furry or, tail, you know, everything. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole nine yards. It's, it's really embarrassing. Now, the older occult traditions are considerably more serious than that. Um, they are not about devil worship, by the way. That was the, the whole devil worship thing. That was an offshoot of the same kind. Another party scene that got going in the, in the late Middle Ages. Um, serious occultism dates from ancient Greece. It draws it drew um, traditions from Egypt and, and Babylonia. Um, it is. It has its own vision of the divine. It has its own spiritual practices. If you're a serious occultist, you do a lot of meditation. Um, you do a lot. You know, there's all kinds of things. There, there are. You know, there are rules in the whole nine yards. It's its own religion, basically, um, and it's it's certainly it's its own tradition, and. We get just as embarrassed at um, you know people like the neo pagans as uh, serious trad Christians get. I'm, I don't yeah. I don't even know who the current flock of, of you know uh, the the um, Christianity light. Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know these I, days. Well, I mean, I, I, rem- I, I remember. I remember the Jesus people back in the day. Oh mm-hmm. Lord. <laughs> <laughs> it's well it, it went from like well it w- it went from like you know your 1940s 50s fire and brimstone and then it kind of mm-hmm. went on to uh mega churches and mm-hmm. and your peter pop-offs and then re- people realized that that was all basically just bs but mm-hmm. now we're in this weird phase i believe and i i go to a house church um, oh, good. Okay, and yeah. it's a mo- it's a much more spiritual. Thing. Yeah, it's much more spiritual heard- communal thing because what church is supposed to be right is it's you know it's I not only coming together discussion and obviously not worshiping some dude who says that the pastor because that's what it ultimately ends up being is this guy's basically the the, the local pope. Uh, yeah, I think, pastor worship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's pastor worship. What mm-hmm. I think um, ultimately is great about it is like um, it, is it comes down to honesty. Because mm-hmm. I feel like love and honesty are this thing that kind of go mm-hmm. hand in hand, and so when you go to the when you go to mm-hmm. a house church like this or some mm-hmm. very local to you know church, everyone's very together. You're kind mm-hmm. of forced to just like be yourself, and because mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. are you just gonna cool. like try and like put up a pageant for God? No, you aren't. He knows you're yeah. bullshitting him. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things about gods. They know when you're faking it. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So exactly. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. Well, well that's, uh, that's cool. I'd, I'd heard some really good things about the house church movement. It's nice to hear that confirmed from someone inside. Yeah, um, right. But yeah, there's. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm glad to hear that the mega church thing is beginning to sunset out. That was so embarrassing. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, I, it's a church. It's a shopping mall. It's it a, it's an IMAX theater. <laughs> it's a shopping mall where you can buy your ticket to to heaven. Basically, that's the idea. Yeah. Oh, um, tacky. I uh, well, so when it comes to so like for okay so for, as a christian the, the ultimate mm-hmm. like something that like i was thinking actually today about how there are people who have bipolarity or depression mm-hmm. and they kind of just mm-hmm. crack it up to chemical imbalance and i really think mm-hmm. it, it comes down to a lack of meaning in in these people's mm-hmm. lives and they're just told by a doctor or you know a therapist oh you're just depressed it's like well <laughs> i mean ask are, we, are they an atheist are, what, what else is going on that could be mm-hmm. causing this and i mm-hmm. because i went through that deal and when I when I realized that basically God is always with me, He's always wanting the best for me. That mm-hmm. was cured. I got like Sweet. literally. It, it's mm-hmm. it's like mm-hmm. my life changed for the better in every single way mm-hmm. when I when I started mm-hmm. just recognizing that God is at the wheel. Um, mm-hmm. Do you? Mm-hmm. Is there some level of that like like almost like uh, you're the there there like there's a sense of meaning 
w- yeah. with in your own spirituality? Oh, good heavens, yes. Yeah. The, um, the the thing is, from from within. I mean, again, ask ask three druids, get at least five answers. But from within, yeah. within my understanding of druidry, and within the sense the the understanding of other druids that I know, the, you know, again, it's not just a lump of dead rock. We, yes. You know, yes. We are not. We are not just. You know. We come into being. We live. We croak. That's. I mean. That, that's the science. That's the scientific. That's the, the materialist lie. And you know. Yes. No wonder people who get taught that end up horribly depressed. It's a very depressing way to live. But no, the universe, as understood, within the druid traditions that I have learned that I follow, um, first of all, our souls are our souls. Our souls are immortal. Yes. Um, we actually go through many bodies. Um, Druidry is one of the faiths that believes in reincarnation. Okay. And so, you know, there's, this is not all there is. Death is not an end. Death is a transition. It's from, from one state to another. How you spend this life is going to have a major impact on, how you're, on what happens the next time around. So uh, speaking of the need for morality, um, the, yes, the Hindu sir. concept of karma is fairly close to to the Druid teaching, so a lot of us just use that word because everyone knows what it means. Yes. But you know, there is that there is, there is that moral force, there is that moral requirement, um, because and you know, and it's it's very automatic. It's very you know, what you do is shaping who you are, and who you are shapes what you experience in the world. That happens even within within our own our own individual lives. But ba- so basically, we are all all souls are going through this, this process of spiritual evolution, of spiritual development over time. Um, we've been involved in, the, we've been on that path for many, many lives. We'll be on, you know, on that path for many lives further. Um, there are, we can become much wiser, much better than we are. And that's what we're working towards. Yes. And 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 the world exi- the, the world. I mean, the world has many reasons for being. There's lots of stuff going on. There are many different kinds of beings who are incarnated. Again, we believe that that every living thing has a soul. Um, that's plants as well as animals. They're each going through their the kind of experience that they need, as we're going through the experiences we need. Interesting. But we're all on our way toward. You know, becoming what we're capable of becoming, which is again something much wiser and much better than we are now, that takes a lot of work. But because there's a goal, because there's meaning to it, because there is this great sweep of time through which we can climb upwards, um, yeah, there's there's plenty of room for meaning in the world. In fact, you have to make an effort to pretend that it's not there. Oh, dude, yeah. I, that's yeah, why exactly. I always like. I don't even believe atheists are atheists. I just think it's it's like a it's the very very bottom level of like okay, you're at the beginning. So, you, you know, it's it's. <laughs> I, I, I for don't a lot think, of people, yeah. That's true. Uh-huh. Oh, oh the, the other thing that I've noticed, by mm-hmm. the way, is that a lot of atheists are actually not atheists. They're a Christians. They just they yeah. don't they they have this very problematic relation mm-hmm. with the Christian faith for whatever reason, probably, typically things in childhood or what have you. Yes, and they spend all this time rebelling against it. It's really funny because I, I've had these conversations where I'm talking with an atheist and I'm talking about the druid conception of the divine. Yes. and they're going, no, no, that's that that can't be. You can't actually believe that. And they bring <laughs> out the Christian concept of divinity. That's the <laughs> only one they're willing to address. Yes. Partly that's because that's all their arguments, but it's clear it's clear they're they're practically Christian. The only place in which they disagree with Christians is they don't happen to believe that that kind of God exists. Well, it's almost like a, a rebelling of the of the culture that they grew up in. It's yeah. almost a self hatred. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yes, I think there's a lot of that. And again, that's thus you get the depression. Thus you get some right. of the other problems. Yeah. Exactly. And a worship of desires. And worship um, of desires, worship which, of progress, worship of surrogates of yes, various kinds. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, I've kind of exhausted all my spirituality questions. Those were, that was just great. Um, okay. What I so I am in the same exact headspace when it comes to um, a collapse. So when it comes mm-hmm. to things slowing down. So my big deal. The reason I started my blog a few months ago. Mm-hmm. The reason I started this podcast. Is ultimately because there 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 are macroeconomic issues mm-hmm. that I feel are completely unaddressed or, or addressed okay. by very okay. niche people, and mm-hmm. um, there is an so here uh, 
Uh, let's see here. Sorry. Um, so I guess to start out that, uh, mm-hmm. do you believe, um, so I, I guess I just want to explore at first what, where, do you believe that we are going or, or leading to some catabolic collapse and maybe oh, ex- already, explore that idea that you've actually written happening. about? It's already happening. Let's okay. talk about catabolic collapse. Okay. Basically, societies go through a cycle. There's this process that we, you look through history, you see societies rise and they peak and they decline and they fall. It's just like a life cycle. Like human beings are born, they grow up, they get old, they die. Civilizations do exactly the same thing. It's essential to the, the religion of progress, to the, the ideologies of modern politics, that that can't happen to us because we're smart. It's right. happening to us. It's been happening. We're actually almost 100, actually more than 100 years into the process by which industrial civilization is winding down. Now, this suggests that it's not fast, and that's exactly one of the major points I like to, I like to bring up, which is that civilizations don't fall overnight. The Hollywood catastrophe, you know, everything's fine, and then bang, bang, boom, down it goes. Mm-hmm. That's purely a convenience for movie makers. Right. Okay. Um, real civilizations take their time going down. But again, we've been at it for more than 100 years. The, pe- the, the point at which Western industrial civilization peaked and began to decline was the beginning of the First World War. Okay. You can tell that because in 1914, um, European nations and nations that were populated from Europe, like the United States, okay, basically owned the entire planet. If you look at the British Empire plus the French Empire plus the Russian Empire plus um, the the other little empires plus the United States in its holdings and so on, um, and the the countries that had been the Spanish Empire before the British popped them loose in the 1830s, um, you're talking the whole world. Right was under uh, under and uh, you know a quarter of the Earth's land surface and all of its oceans were controlled from London, yes. from the, in the tiny little country of Britain. Mm-hmm. It's just it. And that was, that was the peak when they started into internecine warfare in 1914. The great, future historians will talk about the Great European War from 1914 to 1945 because, you know, there, yeah, there was a pause in there briefly, but the hostility never really stopped. And, um, but that's, that's a very common way that civilizations start to decline. They, they, start, they start fighting each other. And you know the individual yes. nations or political leaders, and so on. You have that process of warfare. Technology is a lagging indicator. I mean, Roman technology reached its peak um, long after the empire had was already well into decline. And so we're having the same thing. People say, "Oh, but we have all this technology." Yeah, look <laughs> at the world. Look at the state the world yes, is in yes. compared to what it was in in 1910. Yes. And so we have this long, ragged road of decline. Now, catabolic collapse, you know this, but our listeners may not. Yes. The point of catabolic collapse is really simple. I, I mean, I kind of work it out in this, in this complex paper with all these algebraic diagrams. <laughs> yeah, you so did. <laughs> be, be, because you, you got to do that. You, you got to do that. If you, I mean, I was originally hoping to get it published in a peer-reviewed journal. I couldn't get anyone to take it because wow. I didn't have a I, – no, I didn't have a university placement. These days, if you're not working in the academic industry, try getting something to appear wow. in a journal. You'll have a fun time. Wow. But so, but fortunately, I got independently published. It's been it's it's been included in a couple of my books at this point. Okay. So, but so the so the basic idea is is really simple. The idea is that civilizations build more stuff than they can maintain. Yes. Um, look at any American city right now. They put in. All of these, you know, water Strip mains malls. under the streets. No, I'm thinking the, the basic structure, oh, the okay. water mains, the power lines, the, um, the sewer lines, all of this stuff, it was put in, it was fairly cheap because they had, you know, like empty fields to work with as they expanded subdivisions and so on. And they built up all these houses and then you have to maintain them. And you have mm-hmm. to repair them. And that costs and it costs and it costs. And finally, they break down anyway. Right now, uh, what was the figure? Something like half the water that goes into the New York City um, municipal water system never reaches a tap because it's wow. so full of leaks. Wow. And there's all of these. There, there's any, I mean, if you go to New York, it's just 
cruddy. It's falling apart. Yes. Because they don't have the maintenance budget to maintain it. And so, and this is the case. This is the case. Well, in America generally, I mean, I, I highly recommend taking a trip by train. You know, you take yes. the plane, you don't see what's in between, but you, you take the train, you go through what used to be the business districts, the industrial neighborhoods, you will see the same kind of wreckage that you, anyone who saw pictures of the Soviet Union right around the time it went down, yes. it looks just like that. You've got all of these decaying former factories, you've got abandoned houses, you've got desolation spreading all over the place. This is catabolic collapse. And you know it's what? That, yeah, go ahead. So... The reason I absolutely 100% agree is is mm -hmm. there has been since especially 2008, you probably mm -hmm. know it, is GDPs, <laughs> pretty much the entire Euro European Union, mm -hmm. uh, Eastern Europe, uh, parts of Asia, actually Asia's d benefited the most over the last 10 or so years, um, Africa, uh, emerging markets, they have all experienced GDP flattening out. Um, mm -hmm. what, we've, what we've experienced... You know, post two thousand eight is the fact that banks, the world round, do not trust one another when it comes to, um, you know, they, because you had your private label mortgage backed securities that you could just, mm -hmm. you know, cook up and then go use as collateral, and and everyone mm -hmm. just trusted it. Now you can't. Now all you have mm -hmm. is basically U.S. Treasuries or maybe Euro uh, Euro Treasuries and, that people and, trust. And those are, and those are just as you know. Just as imaginary as the as the privately backed uh, mortgage based securities. I mean, when sure, you have, yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, the the it's U.S. Faith. is churning, it's faith in it's, them. Yeah, the U.S. is churning out these unpayable IOUs. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got this debate that they just had in Congress. So we're going to raise the borrowing limit again. Now, <laughs> most of that borrowing, it's actually the U.S. Treasury buying its own bond, printing money to buy its own bonds. Yes. And, which, come on, this is this is like you know this is like this is the ultimate check kiting maneuver, <laughs> and um, you know we and we have to do that because everyone else is starting to realize that all these T bills out there aren't actually ever going to be. You can't actually exchange them for value. There's more, and you know, and there's more paper IOUs out there than. The world economy is capable of of uh, matching yes. with goods and services. A quadrillion in derivatives. Yes, it's it's insane. Yes. But the the thing is, um, in the 1980s, um, and of course, in the 1970s, the United States um, had its first hard brush with the limits to growth, and at that point, um, there was serious talk about about you know putting on the brakes and saying, okay, we've reached our peak right. in terms of prosperity, and yeah. then things are going to taper off from here, but. You know, we had the Reagan era morning. It's morning in America. No, no, no. We can keep on growing forever. And what they did is they made this transition from an asset-based economy where your what you could borrow depended on what stuff you actually exactly. owned to a debt-based economy where what you could borrow depended on how much debt you owed, you owned. And so that, since debt could be manufactured freely, we've had from, 19, from about 1982, 83 on, we have had the develop the building of the world's ultimate Ponzi scheme. Yes. The entire global economy is a gargantuan Ponzi scheme where debt is being manufactured by, you know, just by people deciding here, you know, here's, you know, I'm going to pay you. A, bi a million, billion, trillion dollars. I don't know if, when, when you were a kid, did people ever, did, did kids ever do IOUs like that? You know, <laughs> right. A million, IOU, a million, billion, right. trillion dollars. And yeah, exactly. I see, there, there you have the frontiers of modern high finance. Because that's basically all they're doing. And, and, and they're, using this, they're using this as collateral. They're building these immense piles of debt on top. Yes, exactly. And well, yeah. it can't be paid. No. And, and, and when, when, so the, I think the issue ultimately came from the fact that after World War II, we just cooked up this totally half-assed system where we're like, oh, we'll just use dollars because that's the only thing that the world can mm -hmm. trust. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll just bail everyone out. And then, oh shit, Italy is already going through issues and they need dollars. Oh shit. Well, this has gotten out of hand already. And so uh -huh. we're now working on a system that was already broken at first, has definitely been broken since 2008. And now we're going yeah. through this, like, uh, uh, we're going through this dystopia LARPing <laughs> and, and, and hoping that it somehow works out on the proles who have guns. And it's just, yeah. it's, 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 it's an amazing thing to watch. 
really. You know, in, yes. in its own oh, way. Well, it's amazing. Exactly. You know, entertaining in its own way, but oh, Lord. <laughs> Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really have no idea exactly what's going to happen next, because I don't know of a case in history wh- where things have gone this far into um, into imaginary value, into you right. know, the building up of piles of debt. I think, you know, modern industrial society has achieved its greatest achievement is the most delusional economic system in the history of ever. Um. <clears throat> so that brings me to the ultimately how I found you because you said mm-hmm. something that I was just like exactly like why is no one saying this about the Great Reset and Klaus Schwab, <laughs> Doctor Evil? Oh, that, that, is it that, a great that, or uh, excuse me? Is it a red herring? Is it just a narrative to keep the proles at bay? Well, I the, the, the okay the keep thing them scared that, to maintain legitimacy. That, yeah, the thing I see here is that it's crucial to remember that the, the, the privileged classes, the political classes, are not a unified block. There's not, not a, you know, this hierarchical organization of, you know, of people who, who are all on the same page and follow orders coming down from some, you know, um, some skyscraper in, in New York or something. Yeah. What you've got is a, is a bunch of individual power centers that are all constantly competing for wealth and influence, Mm -hmm. and they're struggling with each other. You can see this in D.C. right now. There's a clutch of people around Joe Biden, and there's a clutch of people around Kamala Harris. And they are, the, the, the Biden crew, they're in control for the moment, but Harris is very clearly positioning herself to take over. And when she, you know, once, once Biden croaks or what have you, if he does, um, as I, as I expect he will, it's a, talk about a meat grinder job. Um, but you know, when then that group is out and Harris's group is in, and they're obviously planning on hitting the ground running and pulling things their way. And but you have all of these pressure groups trying to get what they want. Klaus Schwab is the mouthpiece mouthpiece for one of those, and he has this great reset agenda, which is part of the sort of general EU agenda mm-hmm. of a, a bu- unelected bureaucratic and corporate <laughs> government running everything. So you know, it's as I mentioned as I mentioned in in the post that you that you cited, um, all the, the what they what the, what the Great Reset amounts to is 1930s Stalinism. Yes, it's exactly the same thing that the Soviet Union was talking about in the early days of the Stalin regime. You know, you'll you'll own nothing. The state will provide everything for you. You'll be happy because we tell you to be happy. Um, it's like the old joke, you know, the um, when comes the revolution, comrade, we will all eat strawberries and cream. The little voice <laughs> right. comes to the crowd saying, "But what if we don't well, like strawberries uh, and cream?" And, yeah, and the like, orator shouts, "Comes the revolution, comrade, you will eat what you are told." Like. <laughs> How do how yeah. do people even fall for this in this world where we have like l- several verifiable on camera? Look it up on YouTube. Like anything when it comes to you know, let you go listen to just the the uh, the Gulag Archipelago, right? Yeah. There's so many or the Yuri Bezmenov interview. Yeah. Are people going? I I guess I guess not. I mean, I I really feel like they kind of already know that it's BS, and they're they uh-huh. are. I feel like there's some level of just preparing for when stuff mm-hmm. does kind of uh, fall apart more and more mm-hmm. um, that I, they'll just yeah yeah I think Schwab, I think Schwab actually believes it he is he is a bureaucrat he is you know he has academic background right. he is insulated from the real world yes. and you know so he has this little clique of people who are daydreaming about um, being the the new Politburo. And ten, sending the people they don't like to to, to their own Siberia, and this kind of, or you know, just gunning them down in the typical <laughs> Stalinist sense. Pretty much. And and so they've got this fantasy, but and they're trying to get other people in the elite to, to sign on and all this kind of stuff. And this kind of thing happens on the fringes of the elite all the time. I mean, the the Trilateral Commission is always pushing its version of what people should do. The Council on Foreign Relations is pushing its version. They're all busy jockeying for position and trying to get. But but I think. I think really the whole Great Reset thing, it's, it, it, is, it is elite LARPing. It's very much like all elite these, LARPing. these elite yep. LARPing. Yeah, the, like these people going to you know, Davos. Yes. They're going to go to Davos because we're the important people. We're going to solve the world's problems. And you know, they all fly to Davos in their private airplanes, belching CO2 as <laughs> yes. they go, to sit there and listen to poor Greta Thunberg. 
you know, the, oh, the, yes. who just, who, who's, who, who's basically, you know, a wind-up doll, um, mm-hmm. you know, reciting the stuff her parents told her to recite. Yep. And, and, you know, going through the motions of being angry and so on. And, she, and they're going, oh, isn't that cute? Dude. And, and then they get back. Then they get back into their private jets and fly home and invest into their ten billion dollars in, in yes. you know, oil futures. So it's all you know. It's it, you have to remember. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to to meet and talk to people who grew up really rich. I, I have had that for, on on a couple of occasions. Mm-hmm. Long, complex story in every case. They are the most clueless, disconnected incompetent people you will ever meet. They literally don't know how to blow their noses without help. You know what, dude? I yeah. I have someone in my life that uh-huh. uh, I am obliged that, to know, and I know exactly what you mean. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. These people literally, they are totally disconnected from the real That's world. That's a good point. So and, when you have a bunch of them in an echo chamber saying how they're going to exactly. be the, the Politburo yeah, exactly. of the future, yeah, they, they, they exactly. could definitely so make themselves you've, believe you've that. Cl- you've, cl- you've closed Schwab, who, who you know... Again, who was, who was probably, you know, never spent a day without servants taking care of him. <laughs> Pretty um, much, and he's 83, and, so... Yeah, exactly. He's in, the, he's in this nice little bubble, surrounded by, by yes-men, mm-hmm. and um, by, by um, cronies and flunkies and flax. And so he's daydreaming, and he, I, I doubt he has ever gotten like just gotten on a city bus and gone to the poor right. end of town and sat oh, in a dude. bar and listened to what people said. If you, I, I, I keep, I've routinely challenged people yes. who have this kind of attitude to do that. Just get on oh, a dude. city bus. Yes. Dare, they will, oh my God, watch, when the, I, watch well, the backpedaling. Dude, when I was like, yeah, when I was like 18, 19, and I, I, I couldn't even afford a car, I lived in the ghetto. Yeah. I had to like start yeah, yeah. from the beginning, and I uh, freaking, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, getting on the bus, You, I live in Houston, so uh, oh, yeah. that is almost like what Chicago will be in, or, or, or excuse me, Houston will be Chicago in probably 20, 10, 20 years, oh, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, it's going through those motions, but you see it in, in uh, I mean, obviously, we all know it, just the, the spiritual malaise and cynicism among just the general Joe mm-hmm. Blow walking on the, on the sidewalk, but just the streets and the buses themselves, everything is like barely kind of g- like getting on. Like, hey, I thought what I like, I bet people back in the 70s or 80s when they thought about, you know, 2020, it was going to be this. Oh, oh th- yeah. This clean, beautiful, you know, brave go, new world, but it's go, not. Yeah, go, go online and see if you can find old magazines from like from the 1970s oh, talking about the future <laughs> it's the funniest Starry-eyed, yeah. thing you will ever see because yeah you've got these clean high tech um you know um Everyone lives in the suburbs, of course, and, oh, dude, pe- and yeah. flying cars. Yep. One must have flying cars. <laughs> do, you, do you mind if I rant just a little bit about flying cars? Yeah, go ahead, man. <laughs> okay, because fl- flying cars—that's the wet dream. Yes. Of the of of the techno twit these days, everyone. The oh, Star Trek boomer. Soon, oh yeah, someday soon we'll have flying cars. Do you know when the first flying car was built? 1917. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously, there have been flying cars nearly as long as there have been airplanes. Yeah. Curtis, um, what's his name? Curtis, the guy who, the guy who founded the, um, the Curtis Aircraft Company, built one. It didn't work very well. Yes. Um, they've built them ever, ever since. Every few years, somebody built a flying car. And the reason they don't work, it's – now, if you, if you have any exposure to engineering, you know that – you have to optimize for whatever your situation is, and you know you pull if if you go this way, it's less good for that, and if you go that way, it's less good for this. Exactly. If you want a good airplane and you want a good car, they require the opposite. Alterations. You know what, man? Yeah. You you I really want to this now that you bring this up. Uh-huh. I I this is another thing that no one ever talks about, but I just uh-huh. I'm I'm calling the bluff. Is this giant move towards? Uh, you know, electric cars, everything electric, and it's just like you can literally Where, do like ten minutes of simple looking up math, yeah, and then like, hey, our you. electric grid can't even handle like a quarter of that. Exactly. What, what do you think Where about all that? Like, going to get like, the like, electricity. Like, they want to like make everything electric by 2030 in certain countries and all that crap. What? Yeah, I know. It's complete garbage because yes. where are we going to get the electricity? We don't have enough electricity to keep our grid fully powered now yeah. in extreme times. I mean, you know that from, from yes, living in Texas. in Texas. Yes, exactly. Exactly. You know, we don't have the power to run 
our refrigerators and air conditioners adding a complete adding you know 100 and 200 million cars to that oh my goodness yeah no a, this is this is this is dumb i mean boxes of rocks have more brains than that but yeah. but yeah. nobody want nobody it's... wants it it's yeah it's that's a it's, it's it's very much the same kind of thing as the flying cars or fusion power everybody loves to babble about fusion power yeah. okay we're going to have fusion now of course partly when I was born, fusion power was 20 years in the future. Yeah. I'm a lot older than 20. Okay. <laughs> Every few years, it's fusion power will be 20 years, yes, 20 years exactly. in the future. I, I read that in, in a newspaper article a year ago. In fusion, within 20 years, we'll have cheap, abundant fusion power. You know, 10 million years from now, when the last human beings go extinct and we're replaced by intelligent creatures descended from chipmunks, <laughs> fusion power will still be 20 years yes. in the future. And the, there's, there's, there's a good reason for that. Because the reason that fusion power doesn't work has nothing... There's a lot of serious technical problems. But the main thing, it can't pay for itself. Okay? A yes. fusion react... The, 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 the estimates back in the day were that a fusion reactor would cost 10 times as much as a, as a regular fission nuclear power plant and only produce about the same amount of electricity. And nuclear power is so expensive. Most, you know, no nation has ever been able to afford exactly. it. Exactly. Well, huge, I think of all that. Government. Yeah. They yeah. Think of all the government starting subsidies. capital you need and then... Exactly. Yeah. And so multiply that. And this was when they thought that the kind of basic tokamak structure wouldn't, wouldn't work. At this point, we're talking about something that's 100 times as expensive. I mean, to judge by the, the ITER program in, in Europe, the big um, nuclear fusion power thing, it's, we're talking 100 times more expensive than an, than an ordinary efficient nuclear power plant to make the same amount of electricity. Okay, here, Mabel, here's your, you know, your um, power bill for new fusion electricity. It's going to cost you $15,000 a month. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. So you're going to be able to afford that. That's the thing. Nobody wants to talk about whether it can be, whether we can afford it. Nobody wants to talk about whether it's technically feasible, whether it actually will work in the real world. It's all just LARPing. Well, yeah, it's, you're right. It's freaking technocrat uh, LARPing. But Mm -hmm. it makes me wonder what it's going to look. So have you read The Fourth Turning? Oh, yeah. Okay. So you know, you know about what I'm about about to Mm -hmm. say, which is Mm -hmm. uh, we're in the crisis generation. It's about to come to an end probably within five to ten years. Mm-hmm. What will will the bluffs be called? Will we what do you think there is some like we'll be able to you know humble ourselves and be like, okay, we can't keep doing this expanding out, making uh mm-hmm. you know, like Houston, if Houston's probably the worst city in the in the country when it comes to just urban sprawl. And 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 I when I when I go back to it when I for work or when I see family, it's just it's it's I, I get reminded of why I I left it because it's it's just spiritually <laughs> awful apart from being in a swamp you know but yeah. <laughs> uh it's it, you mm-hmm. just kind of wonder like will 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 the bluff be called will they realize okay we got to actually chill out for the next few decades and stop pretending like we can keep building you know more strip malls and 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 more electric cars or whatever I I think what my working guess based on what's happening in the global economy especially in China right now is that we are oh, yeah on the brink of some serious economic discontinuities. Yes. If you want to translate that, that as Great Depression, um, I think we could very well be facing conditions like those in the 1930s. Now, the great thing about that, I mean, the miserable thing to live through, I, I, when I was younger, I knew people who lived through it, yes. and they had, they had stories. Yeah. But the great thing about that kind of experience is that it's an opportunity to clear away a lot of wreckage. And yes. so, you know, um, especially, especially if it is, if it combines with declining population, that's the elephant in the room right now. Oh, dude. Nobody wants to talk about exactly. That. That's the source of all. Yeah. Crest, is cresting and over most of that's that's why that's why one of our political parties is desperately trying to get in as many illegal immigrants as possible wow. because they want well no it's very simple they want to in, to pad out the workforce with a labor force of people who could be forced to work for less than minimum wage right that's the whole point of and it. they have it's kids just, at least yeah, exactly. more than than the native population yeah. does 
Yeah, for for a generation, yeah. And so they're desperately trying to keep the fantasy of growth going because growth includes population growth. Yeah. Among other things, once population crests and begins to decline, there's an immense amount of real estate right now that it only has the value that it has because people think, well, I can sell it for a higher price exactly. later. If you have fewer people in the market each generation thereafter, all of a sudden your real estate is only worth the value of living in it, and that's going to cause an enormous number of people, rich Mm -hmm. all the way down to the middle class, to lose an enormous amount of notional wealth. And if you think about it, this is something I've like taken a step back and thought about. Mm -hmm. Is like, isn't it insane that most people, their entire like dream in life, especially like you know boomers, it it Mm -hmm. has been, oh, I'm just going to get a house and then flip it in twenty or thirty years, and that's my that's my economic, uh, you know, uh, that's what I provide to the economy is is buying a house and then selling it for a higher price. Yeah, I'm. Bluntly, my generation has a lot to answer for. I'm a trailer, <laughs> and I, I am, I am frankly very, very embarrassed by my generation. You're a noble boomer. <laughs> You're a noble boomer. And, it's okay. Yeah, and it's one of those things. But yeah, there, this pe- people, people are stuck in this fantasy of growth, in this, this, this conviction that the economy must continue to expand. Exactly. Because, you know, everything they've done is based on the idea, yeah, you can buy a house at X and sell it in 20 or 30 years at this vastly inflated price. Once you no longer have a growing population, that's no longer true. And so at that point, all real estate investments um, on average lose money. On that, at that point, most other investments, on average, lose money, and at that point, the whole house of cards come toppling down. Now, will it come down at once? No, because the you know the various people whose whose influence and wealth depend on keeping the house of cards up are going to. There, there is nothing they will not do to prop things up. Yeah, they'll but kicking and screaming. They, yeah, yeah. They'll they'll, they'll do. They'll do every, they're going to pull. I mean, they already have been pulling out every trick in the book for the last forty years, yeah. and it hasn't worked. Because nobody's actually willing to grapple with the fact that all of this, this, this immense boom, was a temporary phenomenon. It was, you know, the, it was not the road to the stars, you know, the, right. the, again, the myth of progress. Exactly. We got a lot of cheap petroleum and a lot of cheap coal, and we burnt through it, mm-hmm. and very, very, you know, it was a lot of fun. It's like, you know, your parents go away for the weekend, and you invite all your friends over on Saturday and break out the booze, <laughs> and then you wake yeah. up Sunday morning at about... 11 a.m. Yep. and the inside of your mouth feels like a bird cage. Yep. And it's anyone's guess if you can make it to the bathroom before you puke. And the whole place is totally trashed. And now you have to deal with it. That's the situation in America today. You know, we trashed the place through, you know, through the grand party of the 20th century. And now we're waking up, and it is a mess. And most of us are going, "Oh God, well, kill me now!" <laughs> it, right? It's like um, something I posted literally uh, just yesterday mm-hmm. was was how the average age or the it was rather the median average the median mm-hmm. age of the typical american went from what was it 30 years old to, in 1980 to uh, pushing 40 right now but you can go to china mm-hmm. and look at an even worse situation where oh, yeah. they had like yeah they had like 10 15 years of just amazing economic growth and then mm-hmm. since 2016 it's starting to peter off and then oh yeah their po- I, I think the number was yeah. was their average age every year goes up something like six months or maybe every two years. So yeah. easily yeah, within a couple decades, yeah, you're going to have this this Japanese situation where the mm-hmm. uh, geriatrics have have are the average that, citizen. That is, and the thing is, that's happening worldwide. Right. It's again, this is normal. If you read if you read late Roman literature, one of the major things that happened after the Roman Empire peaked and began to decline, the population started dropping. And dropping, and wow. dropping, and you get to situations like post-Roman Britain, where the the, the Saxons showed up, and they, they had some battles and so on, but it wasn't that much. Wow. And so you have these Saxon poems where they're talking about these cities, these ruined Roman cities, and going, how could there ever have been that many people living here? I mean, it, it right. got to the point in at the bottom of the Dark Ages. Okay, there was a war between two between two warlords for which would be the king of Wessex, which was one of the seven countries yes. into which England was divided in those days. Yes. And one of them had, I think, 120 soldiers in his army, and the other one had like 95 in their armies for the rule of a kingdom, because that's what the population was like in those days. Holy crap! The popu- population 
in in the waning period of a civilization because it's so first of all it's so expensive to raise children oh yeah and i and mean so it's the, just the environment now is like i wouldn't want to have a kid exactly I, i'd have to and go live in the woods so, so that i can feel like they're safe and not being freaking exactly. brainwashed yeah. and that's true and that's true of most people and so population right. decline there's all kinds of factors and so you have the normal curve of depopulation over a period of like um one to three centuries you'll go down 90 90 95 percent wow. and, and the thing is this is normal this is a normal part of the way civilizations mature and age out and so since we have the first global civilization in history we're going to have the first global example of that. No, it bottoms out. You're right. It well, bottoms out. You, 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 you have would a dark, you say you have a dark it, age of me. Yeah, you have a dark age of maybe 500 years, and then new civilizations are born. And, you know, yeah. that's, but that's, that's normal. Well, would you say Deal. that it, it almost mean reverts, and then... Mm-hmm. So it's, and that's the thing, it's like, um, I've been reading Leviathan, and mm-hmm. even Thomas Hobbes, Ooh. like, he mentions, you know, you're, you're, he's obviously extremely inspired by Plato, um, uh-huh. and it's like, well... In those, what is it, uh, freaking, what, I think 2,000 years between the two? Um, about that. About that, right, about that, maybe 1,800 or so. But they, they, they between that time, they're, and you even say it in, in, your, in, your, in, your, uh, in your paper, is how, mm-hmm. um, you know, Rome, you, you have the Roman collapse. I mean, even, they, they, Plato didn't even get to see the, the Roman Empire at, at its no. extent, and it fell, and then... Mm-hmm. And then but, it, he, it, but he knew... He knew of other civilizations that occurred. Right. Well, so, even yeah. Egypt, you could, or or like the Bronze exactly. Age collapse, not too long exactly. before, a few hundred years before. It's like, hey, we've literally seen like the known world collapse. Exactly. Yeah. You know, um, I I don't happen to know what they're currently saying with biblical criticism these days, but the Book of Ecclesiastes, yes. I tend to think, was probably written by someone who was witnessing one of these decline processes because it's very it. it it's wow. very kind of pessimistic viewpoint, and you oh, know, yeah. um, where is God? Yeah, you know, where because because right now in this in this twilight situation, you know, we don't know. All we all we can do is follow the commandments and trudge through our lives and hope for the best, and that's that's very common. But again, it it doesn't just revert to the mean; it actually shoots below the mean. By the way, wow, it's a, it basically think of a sine wave. Because right. that's what we, global population is a sine wave. It rises and then it, and it's a sine wave with other other smaller waves um, overlaid on it. So it's a complex curve. But yeah, no, it drops way down and then it comes back up again as you know as things recover, as ecosystems recover. So there are more resources, more food, oh, yeah. clean water, clean air, all this kind of stuff. Rome was responsible for a lot of toxic pollution. And so wow. yeah, yeah. Um, so you've got all of these factors that tend to drive this cycle, and we're on the downslope of it. And that's, you know, in, if, if you happen to be dreaming about a Star Trek future, that's kind of a bummer. <laughs> right, but right. But if you are a little more realistic and you say, okay, well, you know, we are just like each of us is going to get old and die unless we, you know, wrap our car around a tree on uh, before yeah. we get there. Um, yeah. Every civilization is going to get old and die and then another one comes along. It's, and yeah, so, it's... so relax, deal. This is the hand we've been dealt. How can we make the best of it? Right. Do you, um, how do you feel about like, I don't know, if, you, if you're really certain of this and, and mm-hmm. you're kind of seeing the signs of it, is there preparation that can be done? How, hmm. Do you think that, um, you know, pe- you, well, because like right now, society is as atomized in terms of community mm-hmm. as it could be. Oh, yeah. Do you see a return to that to some extent? A return to community? Well, because I have to kind it, of. In time, yes. Okay. Um, okay. Two things, because you've asked two questions that are both really good ones. The first is, are there preparations you can make? Of course. I don't recommend the whole hog survivalist thing. You know, this is not yeah. the kind of situation where you can hole up in a deer camp while the world crashes and burns. Right. Um, like you it, said, it's not It's not Hollywood. Yeah. It's not Hollywood. It's not exactly. Um, but I, I'm very much in favor of the attitude of a lot of the a lot of the preppers these days, whose idea is simply make sure you have enough, uh, you have stuff set up to get yourself through the ordinary turbulence of a, of a of a difficult time. Make sure that you know you've got food in the pantry, you've got necessities on hand, you're in good health, you 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 exercise regularly, you do all these things yes. to make sure that you are nimble and prepared and flexible. And so you can deal with rough times, you and your family. That's really sane right now. It's a very good thing to do. Um, 
so there are preparations. None of them, none of those preparations are likely to. Um, they're, they're not going to make the troubles go away. They're not going to enable you to duck out of them on them completely. But mm-hmm. um, if you, with you know, with some preparations, a little bit of luck, you can you can hope to come through this this mess. It happened. This, I mean, many people have been through similar things, even in fairly recent history. Um, I used to recommend, um, I still recommend, in fact, people read some books about people who, some accounts from people who lived through the Great Depression. Studs Terkel has a great book called Hard Times, which is basically an oral history of the Great Depression. He went around, talked to people who lived through it, and say, okay, what was your experience of it? Wow. And you can get an enormous amount of information on that. Or read books from people who lived through the nastier parts of the, of the Second World War in Europe. Yeah. Or, or in Asia, in the Japanese conquered parts of Asia, for example. And you can actually, you can really get a clear idea of what's involved in, you know, being okay, staying, staying safe and staying alive and keeping your family safe through really raunchy times. And this is something that people need to think about because we cannot, it, well, yes, you can if you really want to pretend that it's all going to be fine and, you know, Joe Biden will fix everything or, or whoever, you know, the, the, yeah. Democrat or the Republican equivalent, uh, that, you know, the, the authorities will take care of it all and, and there's nothing, you know, and if you do that, you're probably, you know, your chances of, of starving to death in a ditch are fairly high. <laughs> and so, you know, don't go there. What um, do you th- ass- Assume that the authorities don't know what they're doing because they don't. They don't have a clue oh, yeah. at this oh, point. Oh, yeah, that's a great axiom to work on in life mm-hmm. is just, like, realize that, yeah, yeah, it, not they everyone have, is altruistic. Yeah, um, and, and, and they have no idea. They have no idea what, the, what they don't understand what's happening. They're living in their mm-hmm. little bubble. Oh, yeah, And yeah. they're going, what, 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 you know? Yes. <laughs> um, so I was, do you, are you, a, do you know who Curtis Yarvin is? Oh, yeah. A.K.A. Mencius Moldbug. A.K.A. Mencius yes. Moldbug, yeah. I, I'm just, mm-hmm. so the, now that I've kind of like been seeing this intro, and he's, you know, he's on Tucker Carlson, I was, mm-hmm. I was, oh, intri- I didn't know he was on Tucker Carlson. Okay. Oh, yeah, right. It, it's, that's the crazy yeah, thing is they, they I referenced, don't do, I don't, I don't do television. I, no, me neither. I, I only, I only ended up like subscribing read. just so I could see that and then unsubscribing because it's like some <laughs> special show. Obviously, they couldn't oh, yeah. have him like totally on on like, you know, syndicated whatever. You know, no, I don't even know. It. I don't even know TV either. I don't. Yeah, I don't watch oh, TV. But I, I, uh, I think it's interesting to see that there's like some level of like people who are just uh, specifically my generation. You know, maybe late teens to thirties mm-hmm. who are mm-hmm. who are very, very, very disenchanted with how you know they they literally mm-hmm. the big difference between like now and say nine eleven is there's this mm-hmm. time of okay, well we did this whole forever war. It ended, and it ended extremely horribly, and we have all this time to realize that that was a failure. We have all of the, these examples yeah. of failure. We kind of just want to, to, to get rid, and, you know, obviously Yarvin's solution is just, you know, regime change. And, and Because, again, we're in that crisis generation. Let's try and make mm-hmm. the, the regime change, the, the end of the crisis, as, as violent, like in the, in, the, in the Portugal sense, as mm-hmm. nice as possible. Mm-hmm. Do, you, mm-hmm. do you think that that, uh, that rise of what they call neo-reactionary or, mm-hmm. you know, this, this conservatism that's kind of disconnected from the neocon and mm-hmm. the, glo- the f- globalization that are a lot a, more like that grounded. Is a flat rejection of the neocons. Yes. 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 I think that's, it's, it really is a positive sign to my mind because, um, precisely because we act for, for the first time in a very long time, we have, we again have conservatives who know that there's, they need to be conserving something. Exactly. Because we had the neo neoconservatives weren't conservative at all. If a neoconservative, you know, take your in any of any of the standard neo if one of them had gone to a Republican Party county convention in nineteen fifty and you know, in anywhere in middle oh, America dude. yeah and had presented their platform as what you know, da 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 they'd have been thrown out so hard they would have left butt prints on the sidewalk. Exactly. You, you know, know that's not what conservatism is. If you're going to conserve, be conservative, you have to conserve something. You're not going to be taking this starry-eyed fantasy of transforming the Middle East and yes. all, all the rest of the. I mean, talk about drooling idiocy. Well, isn't that and, like uh, that's more LARPing of like we're going to fight the commies off? Well, the commies are gone, but they still have the enemy, and they picture him gotta, in the Middle yeah, East. Yeah, we got. Yeah, we got to. We got to find. We got to find some new commies. Right. <laughs> right. Oh, I I remember very clearly the 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 week that um, the Berlin Wall went down. 
mm-hmm. George Will. Bless his heart. George Will, it, uh, like three days before the Berlin Wall came down, uh, had penned this blistering editorial about how the Berlin Wall was not coming down, and people who thought that there was actually liberalization going on or the, the Warsaw Pact was fragile, they were just deluding themselves, and how dare you take away my, my enemies? How wow. dare you take away? It was just this hilarious thing, and then like three days later, down the wall went. Dude. And I, I'm not sure what happened, but it was actually a while before I saw another his editorial. <laughs> oh yeah, he's he, that's a yeah that's 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 going to change was, your that's going to make you like was, reprioritize your life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and Will Will was Will was before the neoconservatives, but he was he was kind of a proto neoconservative. He was very much that kind of that kind of commie bashing, um, strong America, yeah. meaning let's, inv- let's invade 200 extra countries. What do you mean there aren't 200 more countries? Let's invent <laughs> some so we can invade them. Um. Well, um, I guess to leave you off with a question here, there, uh-huh. there's, I guess, on, on that subject, is that, um, you, you say that the whole community thing might take a lot longer than, than mm-hmm. maybe some of us think. Yeah. Um, do you think that the the sort of decentralization of government is already coming, and that that oh yeah, we're, that that's, we're already uh, we're already seeing it in state governments um, flatly refusing to follow the lead of Washington D.C. and we're seeing it in a range of things. Decentralization. I mean, it only made sense to turn the United States into a unitary nation, you know, a nation where everything was run from D.C. while we were an empire. Um, the Fiasco in Afghanistan marks the end of the American empire. Everyone knows that it's just a matter of time before the last of our troops are brought home. Um, And so we're already starting to shift in the direction of decentralization, transferring more things back uh, away from the feds into the hands of the states. It would not surprise me if in another 10, 15 years, we were to see some constitutional amendments to give that teeth. Yeah. And um, but but it's just it's it's things are already move, setting very strongly in that direction. And but the thing about community is precisely that before you can have community, you have to have people who are ready to live in community. You have to pe- have people who are willing to put the needs of the community ahead of their own momentary needs. And that takes a while. Wow. Um, right now, we, especially among the professional managerial class, the media class, the people who are influential, they, they have no concept of putting anything in, ahead of their own momentary needs. Oh, yeah. And our entire culture is biased in that direction. Mm-hmm. So I think one of, the, one of the advantages of hard times, one of the advantages of economic depression, of the various things that we're moving into right now, is that it's a great lesson in why um, completely unchecked hedonistic do whatever you want to isn't always a good idea <laughs> yes and so i think i think you'll find that on the far side of the crisis we're moving into that there will be more of an option for communities um more of more of a tendency for um, states and town and county governments to take more of a lead and again, we're beginning to see this, but there's going to be a lot more. And there, there needs to be more of community groups, more just groups of people coming together to say, no, we're going to, we're going to take care of this ourselves rather than trying to get government to do it for us. Right. And it's interesting how those things kind of end up happening organically without even mm-hmm. people realizing it just kind of if, happens. If they don't happen organically, they don't really happen. Yeah, good point. And that's, you know, it's the, the fantasy of control, the fantasy that we can actually take control of things and make things happen. That's the great delusion of our time. And it's caused a lot of human suffering and a, and a lot of yes. really idiotic. I mean, the whole business in Afghanistan where we had, you know, millions of dollars being spent to teach um, critical gender theory to Afghan <laughs> Right, yes. <laughs> okay. I mean, d- dumb as a brick. I mean, brick, I've met many bricks that were smarter than that. Um, <laughs> but but they, were, they were stuck on this fantasy that all they have to do is, you know, tell people what to believe and that will work. Right. Myth of progress. Even, That's yeah, yeah. the myth of progress. You know, we're we're you know we're the right ones. We're the good people. We're on the cutting edge of progress, and all we have to do is show up and explain things, and everyone will agree with us. And the mere fact that it always fails, yeah, never again, never gets through the bubble. Yeah. Well, John, I really appreciate you coming on here. I'm glad to have been on. It was a good conversation. Thank you.